Hi, it's Dr. Greg Emerson back in Byron Bay with yoga instructor Tonya Burrow from Alaska and now living in Bali. Today we're talking about what is circadian eating and why is it relevant to your health and we're also going to talk about the autonomic nervous system and its relationship to when you should do yoga, when you should eat and the complexities around trying to put that into our 21st century lifestyles. So if you're interested, Let's get into it. Hi, it's Dr. Greg Emerson with the Treat the Cause YouTube channel and podcast. I'm here with Tonya Burrow. If you like what you hear today, make sure you hit the subscribe button and click the bell so you get notifications when a new video comes out and we're going to get into it. So what I'm talking about today is the new research on the circadian rhythm with a circadian eating strategy, which is basically uh, following the traditional eating plan and also honoring our autonomic nervous system. What it means practically is that we have a bigger breakfast, a medium lunch, and a small dinner. It means we eat during the light cycle. So you're eating when the sun comes up and you're finished eating when the sun goes down. And that's basically it. And that honors our circadian rhythm. And that has multiple effects, particularly on the mitochondria uh, and particularly on the autonomic nervous system. And we know that the part of the autonomic nervous system, which Tony is going to talk about because the parasympathetic nervous system is involved in digestion. And that's maximal in the morning and lowest in the evening after it gets dark. Your body starts going to go, I'm going to start thinking about sleep now, not about digesting food. And we know now that your risk of weight gain, your risk of diabetes, particularly in women, is much higher for the same amount of calories eaten if you eat your calories later in the day. So the science is starting to prove the traditional practice of having a bigger meal earlier in the day. Now the beauty is that we're in Byron Bay at the moment just at the end of summer and the light cycle is very long so that you and I get a lot more opportunity to squeeze in our meals during that time. But as we come into winter, two things are going to happen. One is that carbohydrates are going to disappear off our seasonal menu because there won't be so much fruit around. So we'll move to a naturally more ketogenic diet. And two, our eating window will start to close because we'll get much darker which means our intermittent fasting, which is eating during a certain window during the day, becomes a lot smaller. So we get, again, a more traditional diet, which is more healthy fat-based over winter, uh, and the, the, the sh closed eating window. So we get more benefits from intermittent fasting during um, that winter period. Now, that, the whole idea about eating in terms of your circadian rhythm, also has relevance in terms of yoga, because traditionally, you know, Patanjali in the Vedic literature has suggested doing yoga early in the morning, and, and just as the sun's going down, which you're going to tell us about. And there has some benefits to that in terms of the autonomic nervous system, which if you can run us through the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, but then also you and I have discussed the complexities of the circadian eating plan in terms of sleep, in terms of our 21st century lifestyles. It's okay for me at the moment to get up in the morning because I'm busy doing podcasts and, and YouTube videos to have a bigger breakfast. If I'm starting work at seven in the morning, I'm much less inclined to get up and cook a big breakfast. Um, and also social implications. It's much harder to invite your friends around for a big breakfast on the weekend rather than some wine and some uh, a nice meal in the evening. So first of all, Tonya, can you run us through the difference in the, the two different nervous systems and the right nervous system? It's relevance to yoga and perhaps some difficulties in actually following the, the Vedic yoga strategy of doing it early morning and in the evening. <laughs> okay. Well, this is amazing. I'm from Alaska, so circadian rhythm yes. uh, in the winter, around winter solstice, we don't have a large window of light. Yeah, you got to eat within an hour. Eat. <laughs> <laughs> so it has a few implications for uh, the Alaskans still in Alaska. Um, that, I think it's a really amazing thing when you're closest to the equator to live with that circadian rhythm 
And then it poses more challenges as you move away from the equator and as your seasons have shorter or longer uh, windows of time, this light uh, to eat. So that has its own implications that I think might pose challenging for some people. Um, move south for the winter. Yeah, move south for the winter. I mean, uh, all, the, all our <laughs> North American friends on our yoga course, and, and stay tuned on yoga courses because you might get a surprise with what Tonya and I are doing uh, in future, um, were uh, having a month in Bali during their winter. They were, you know, Mehdi yeah. was pitchified about going back to Montreal and, yeah. and minus 30 degrees. But other animals move south for the winter. And it's, it's a good idea. I said to all, all our friends, you know, it's a good idea to get to Bali, you know, during the winter because you can top up on your vitamin D and yeah. vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin so you get you pick up some stores but sorry for interrupting keep going with no, all no, no, no. there's so much here to unpack yeah. isn't there yeah. okay so let's go back to yoga first thing in the morning or in the evening so in all of my readings and all of my trainings i have heard time and time again the best time to practice yoga is before sunrise early morning sadhana or at sunset you know whether they call it the ambrosial hour there's all sorts of interesting examples and definitions of why that's so good. Uh, I love the idea of practicing first thing in the morning or in the evening, but that doesn't always work for me because I champion and put such a high priority on my sleep that I would never cut short my sleep to get up and do my yoga practice during this sunrise time. So for me, uh, if I get to bed early, and I'm naturally waking up before sunrise, it's perfect. It's a perfect time to have a few moments of at least contemplation of pranayama or physical practice. And again, at sunset. But for me, and, and this is just maybe how I avoid cognitive dissonance, for me, my belief is whenever you can get your yoga practice, your pranayama or your meditation in, is the perfect time to do it. And that allows me to be on a less rigid structure that says, oh, it's 4 a.m., I have to get up. It doesn't matter that I couldn't sleep last night and I'm only getting four hours of sleep. I, I just completely disregard that idea. I say first priority is a good night's sleep. Then my next priority is going to be my movement, my asana, my pranayama, or my meditation. And, and when I can figure that in, when I can fit that in, is when I do. But that being said, he has a point. There is this circadian rhythm, right? So it's best to eat during these light hours. It's probably best to practice first thing in the morning and then maybe to have a yin or a restorative or a gentle calming practice right at sunset. Um, we can talk about that. We can talk about how Men and women have different hormonal cycles throughout the day. Women's being on this 28 day cycle, men being on a daily cycle. So your guys' testosterone is the highest in the morning. So it makes sense that you wanna get up in the morning and get at it. It's actually when we have the highest amount of cortisol, which is a sympathetic nervous system and endocrine system response. And then we have melatonin, which helps us sleep at night. That kicks in in the evening time when the sun's down. So cortisol to get us up, get us energized, get us awake. And in the evening, we have a different hormone that's released after the sun has set that gives us this easy resting response in the body. Parasympathetic versus sympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system is gonna be that fight or flight, that freeze or that fawn. It's that response in the body that quickens the heart, right? quickens the breath, it really enlivens all of our senses. Uh, and this can be for many good reasons and for also many bad reasons. I'm sure you can explain a little bit even better than I. But when we are surprised or threatened in some way, the sympathetic response is triggered. And what that does is it gives us this high alert if we need to run, we can run. If we have to fight, we can fight. It increases the blood pressure in the body, the blood sugar goes up, etc. The parasympathetic nervous system is a release 
of all of that into rest and digest. And what that does is it communicates to the body and to the endocrine system that we can now sit down and relax. Digestion is turned back on. We're given this soothing sensation in our body and we become just a little bit more relaxed. Libido goes up, our ability to sleep, and the ability to digest our food is back. So if you live under chronic stress, you're in a state of constant sympathetic response, which has all sorts of detrimental effects on the body. Um, stress in general. So how to bring the body out of that? We call it self-regulation, right? So one of the main, the easiest tools that I know of is pranayama and putting the emphasis on the exhale. Taking long, deep inhales, holding the breath in, and then taking an exhale that is slightly longer than your inhale. And you can count this out to a unique individual process, like your own count, whether it's a count of four, whether it's a count of six or a count of 10, just beginning to count and breathe deep. You can actually self-regulate your own system to move from sympathetic response into parasympathetic response. So what we really want to think about is there is good amounts of stress, right? You have something to do, you have challenges and problems, you find solutions, everything is figure outable, right? Then we live in a state in modern society sometimes where you're getting up, your cortisol is already there, you're amping up with coffee, you're not regulating, you're not breathing, your breath becomes perhaps more shallow, and you're in this constant state of fight and flight, and you sustain that through your entire day, more coffee, more aggravation, less introspection, less calming breath, music, and or environments. You know, it's kind of this go, 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 go. And what long-term effects of that, not only cardiovascular, but the other diseases of stress, of inflammation, of, you know, there's, what was I gonna say? I was actually gonna say digestion. There's a component of digestion where long-term constant stress actually is a detriment to our own digestive systems. And it causes all sorts of issues in the entrate nervous system, in the serotonin that's produced in the gut, and just in general. So what we think is find the circadian rhythm, find daily habits that work for you. If you can, go to bed early, get a good night's sleep, wake up right before or right as the sun is rising and just do some light stretching that pendiculation of moving the body maybe asana maybe an hour and a half practice what do you have time for what fits into your schedule but most importantly taking a moment or three to having these long intentional breaths this long introspective breath this meditative breath practice with that emphasis on the exhale to put your body into that parasympathetic nervous system response. That's when we can use most our prefrontal cortex and make those executive functions. It's when we're most grounded, when we're most interconnected, when we come from a place of trust, instead of this place of tightness, of contraction, of fear, and of fight and flight. Perfect, so in summary, one, you can't run your sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system at the same time. So you're suggesting that doing yoga when you're not in a sympathetic state is a good idea because you can't, if you're meant to be running from a saber-toothed tiger, you're not really going to be good at standing in a posture for five minutes in a yoga practice. Right, and that's what's so beautiful about a yoga practice is so we don't have tigers now, but we have um, angry bosses yeah. or, you know, there's something going on and, and that is what, triggers that par that sympathetic nervous system response, right? So through the process of getting on your mat, focusing on the breath, redirecting the thoughts to the body, actually becoming present in the here and the now, and actually becoming present of the body and what it's experiencing, the air on the skin, the breath in our lungs, and beginning to regulate the breathing and move in union with the breathing, you can actually regulate yourself out of the sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps regulate our stress response, 
helps with our digestion yeah. and allows us to get the rest that we truly, truly need. And the second summary point is if we're going to be in our parasympathetic nervous system, we don't want it focused on digestion rather than our yoga practice. So I find doing yoga before breakfast, as in before I eat something, I just find my yoga practice is not nearly as good if my parasympathetic nervous system is concentrated on digesting yeah. rather than me holding my poses. So try and do your yoga practice fasting. But you also your other point was excellent that the priority is to do the yoga. So I'm looking for a thousand reasons not to get out of bed and do my yoga in the morning. And I can, the fact that, you know, it's a, I, I'm an hour past sunrise, I'm tick, sorry, I can't do my yoga now, I missed out. So your point is, the benefit is doing the yoga, The do it anytime you can, but perhaps we can see the physiological reasons for the traditional practices of doing it in the morning and the evening. And the, the, the other summary point is, of course, you can always tell a true yogi because they will tell you that um, when you wake up in the morning with high testosterone levels, it's the time to get at your yoga practice <laughs> <laughs> versus anything else. So thanks very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Click the subscribe button, click the bell. You can also help um, by supporting me on my Patreon page and the Treat the Cause podcast, Patreon page is where I write much more detailed articles about what I'm doing to stay healthy and living for a long time. Thanks for watching everybody.